Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art, and I'm going to read a little bit more from this book, uh, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. As you can see, I took the tag off, the book tag, so that I could show it and people can see it exactly, by Templin and Goffman. Goffman. And we are in Chapter 5, Lip Service to the Public Health. And we are on page 66, The Fight for a New Biomedical Complex. And I'm going to put my double glasses on. My friend came over tonight and saw me reading like this, and she thinks it's crazy. I hope you don't think I'm crazy. I just haven't had the time to go to the eye doctor to get a different set of glasses. So I'm just going to double put them on again. But I wanted to say a quick word, really quick, uh, about this anti-nuke movement, because I'm very new to the movement and uh, we're putting together a nuclear panel that I think is going to be quite impressive at the University of Oregon. And Jana Thrift with uh, Eugene, Occupy Eugene, she's their media group. She did the videotaping for us at the contest that we won um, for uh, Andrew Ibisu's film uh, on Fukushima Beach, which was completely awesome. And that's a, all of his films, you should get them all, actually. Like... As much as we can support any of these endeavors to get the information out about Fukushima and about the severity, I think it's very important for us to do that. But also, I'd like to say this before I start reading, is that this isn't about doom and gloom. This is about accepting reality, understanding that we're kind of in the nuclear stew. It's not getting better. Fukushima hasn't stopped. Uh, somebody corrected me on my channel today. I haven't had a chance to respond, but they said it's not three nuclear meltdowns, it's five, which is probably true. And they often say three, so I'm like everybody else saying three. And I think it's important for us to correct each other and to demand honesty and science, which is what we're not getting. And to start saying, why do we have to be their guinea pigs? Like, it, it's about time that we just stop the insanity and start trying to resolve the issue. And frankly, we could do without a lot less electricity all over the planet. We don't need to produce as much as we need. Um, anyways, I'm going to get off that soapbox, but I just wanted to say that this is about finding solutions and understanding what it does to our health and to our, the future of our children. It's not like mercury or coal ash or any of that stuff because nuclear pollution actually affects three, four, five generations in the future. So I'm going to get busy reading. We are on the sub chapter called, let me put my double glasses on. Dun, 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 dun. Now I can see really good. Here we go. These glasses don't, doesn't do this trick so easy as the other glasses, but that's the way it is. The fight for a new biomedical complex. <laughs> My friend's right, I do look crazy. The biomedical program at Lawrence. Let me take these off. How about that? That doesn't look crazy. The biomedical program at Livermore was at that time housed in makeshift quarters. It was anticipated and promised by AEC in the original discussions that a laboratory building would be budgeted and constructed with funds to be requested of Congress in the following fiscal year. The Joint Committee on Atomic Energy struck from the AEC budget the funds that were to be used to construct a biomedical complex at Livermore. How sweet of them. This was tantamount to, to the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy stating that the Livermore Biomedical Program was unnecessary. For without facilities to work in, it was hard to envision much of a program being possible. Again, it appeared to the, that the highly vaunted essential program to evaluate the hazard of AEC releases of radioactivity. So necessary when the commissioners were on the hot seat, was no longer essential. Especially since in June 1963, the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty had been signed. No doubt the commissioners felt a great deal of heat was removed by the elimination of that particular source of radioactive fallout. 
Dr. Foster was not about to accept this slap at the Livermore Laboratory, at least not without a fight. So Foster and Goffman went to Washington to a hearing on the AEC appropriation before the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Chairman Seaborg testified that four of the commissioners favored the construction of the Livermore Biomedical Laboratory building, but that Commissioner Ramey felt it was unnecessary. Mr. Ramey had not given, had clearly not given up his antagonism. Doctors Foster and Goffman testified about the importance of the biomedical work at Livermore, its implications, and they urged strongly that the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy reinsert the budget item for facilities so that the work could proceed. Why, precisely, the Joint Committee reversed itself and voted the funds at the Livermore Biomedical Complex will probably be never be known. I'm going to read that again. Why precisely the Joint Committee reversed itself and voted for the Livermore Biomedical Complex will probably never be known. Our opinion is that the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy did not wish to offend Dr. Foster, widely regarded as one of the top leaders in the nuclear weapons technology. In any event, the Livermore Laboratory Biomedical Program did get a building. It did get a begrudging lease on life and was enabled to proceed with its work, but under a severe budget limitation. Reasons for Budget Limitation The severe budget limitations were the result of two phenomena, neither of which had anything to do with the availability of funds to the Atomic Energy Commission. First of all, the hot seat of the AEC commissioners had cooled off considerably with the signing of the treaty to ban nuclear explosions in the atmosphere. Radioactive fallout controversy would die down, so it must, so, or so it must have been hoped. Apparently, the Atomic Energy Commission was having difficulty realizing that several peaceful atom projects might ultimately deliver 20 times as much radiation as did the fallout from nuclear weapons test, and that the cool seat might one day become sizzling. The second reason for budget limitations was Commissioner Ramey. He was by no means, he had by no means given up his antagonism concerning the Livermore biomedical programs having been established in his absence. Every time the Livermore Lawrence Laboratory directors complained to AEC officials about the failure to meet the prior reassurances of budgetary support, they were duly informed that Mr. Ramey was still unhappy and that it might be wiser to go ahead with the greatly reduced biomedical program than to create a major scene which might ultimately result in no program at all. We accepted the reduced program knowing that we could still we could certainly still do much of the important work on radiation hazard. The situation up to the present point as the work developed at Livermore, it became increasingly clear that the promoters of atomic energy technology were dedicated to one goal, bigger and bigger atomic energy programs, with truly little or no concern for the public health and safety aspects of such programs. Maybe I should read that again. As the work developed at Livermore, it became increasingly clear that the promoters of atomic energy technology were dedicated to one goal, bigger and bigger atomic energy programs with truly little or no concern for the public health and safety aspects of such programs, exactly like we have today. The evidence which developed steadily and certainly lent credence to a certain statement by Dr. Peter Metzger that it appears that the Atomic Energy Commission has decided to cope with the danger from radiation by attacking the public fear of it. Dr. Peter Metzger is a biochemist 
Ball Brothers Research Corporation, chairman of the Colorado Committee for Environmental Information. That's who he was. In 1964, the Plowshare Program, to, dedicated to the development and utilization of nuclear explosives for peaceful purposes, held a symposium at the University of California at Davis. Goffman was asked to present a paper on the hazards of man from radioactivity. By then, the biomedical program had been underway a year. That paper was presented, and it stated that we knew far too little about the hazards of radioactivity to comment on the loss of in lives in this generation or future generations from the spewing of radioactivity that would necessarily accompany such projects as digging into interoceanic canal, a sea level type like Panama Canal, by the use of nuclear explosives. And further, that the favorite cliche of atomic energy promoters, namely that, quote, benefits to be achieved outweigh the risks, unquote, was meaningless since no evidence had been adduced concerning these benefits, and tremendous gaps existed in our knowledge of the true risks. So I'm going to stop. I'm at the bottom of page 68. I'm at 11 minutes, 30 seconds, and I think it's better to have shorter of these. And I apologize for not getting back to you, but I'll be honest, this material is pretty heavy for me to read and digest. Um, it's astounding for me to believe that our government actually really knows how harmful radiation really is. And instead of fighting the corporations that want us to lie about it, they're completely complicit with it. It's For me, it's sobering. I, I honestly don't know how they sleep at night. Um, and one of the things I've realized maybe in the last four months is how many people are actually out there attempting to stop the nuclear cartel and their lies. For me, I think it's very important that we talk about the 90% rule. I think it's extremely important that we not just digest their fucking lies and say, oh, well, the ocean's really big or the fish aren't affected. We're not testing. We're not actually testing. We don't really know. That's the thing. We don't know, but you know what? We do know the results. Dana Durford has practically risked his life up in... Uh, British Columbia and he has shown us photographs of no sea life we know why there's no baby orcas no starfish anybody with common sense understands why we're having these diseases so I'm going to end here and you know I hope I, I just hope everybody gets active everybody in New York ought to be going to Helen Caldecott's seminar please go up to Kevin Blanche let yourself be known get to know the post ignorance project people and hopefully we'll all have some courage to step out because honestly, it's up to us. And I believe that we can help demand solutions and that solutions are there and available. We just don't know what they are. Or maybe they do and they haven't been told to us. But I personally don't think it's right that we should all be their guinea pigs. So I'm going to keep reading and I appreciate the 25, 30 people who watch my video and hopefully you can share this information. I'm trying to read better. I'm making an effort to read better so that it's not so hideous and people will actually want to hear this information. So bye, you guys. Um, put your courage feet on. What does my tattoo say? Love is greater than fear. And love is greater than fear. And I actually... I think the universe rewards love and honesty and courage, and I really believe that we'll be able to find solutions and save our planet and save our people and save all our little creatures that are fast going away. So, ciao, you guys. Bye.